my name is Dan Metcalf, and I think what you're referring to most directly is that for the latter part of my government career, more than 25 years, I was head of one of the Department of Justice's 40 components called the Office of Information and Privacy. During that time, what we did in large part, although not entirely, was discharge the Attorney General's government-wide FOIA policy responsibility. And by that I mean to say the obligation to go to all 91 or 92 of the federal agencies, depending upon whether Vice President Cheney had closed one and declared it off limits or not at the time, and tell them what to do and what not to do and give them guidance and the like. So what these Attorney General memoranda really are at bottom, first and foremost, is an articulation of the standard according to which a Justice Department litigator looking at a FOIA lawsuit freshly filed in court, looking at the agency's action, will decide whether or not to defend that agency in court. That's a tremendous power that the Department of Justice wields. When President Clinton was elected and in came Attorney General Janet Reno, who was a true champion of openness in government uh, and an excellent Attorney General as far as I'm concerned, uh, we worked up a standard that replaced what uh, had existed during both Reagan terms and the Bush term. Uh, and that standard was foreseeable harm. That's an idea that occurred to me just one day when I was taking a walk with my oldest daughter. Uh, I knew that I had to come up with something, and there are only so many words in the English language, <laughs> and that seemed like it would work very well, and it did. Because what it, what it, uh, what it carried with it was the notion of discretionary disclosure. In other words, the idea that even if information technically falls within an exemption, it's within the contour as properly determined as a matter of case law by the courts, still it's possible that there would be no real harm in disclosure. And if an agency could see its way clear after giving it some thought to apply that standard and to disclose it anyway as a matter of administrative discretion, even though exempt, more information would be disclosed. And that standard, which was uh, issued in October of 1993, uh, prevailed during the remaining seven plus years of the Clinton administration. Bush 43 came in. I knew that there was not any doubt whatsoever that in turn the Reno Memorandum would be rescinded and replaced, that there would be a John Ashcroft Memorandum sooner or later. And I worked on that and came up with the standard that was used there of a sound legal basis, which I suggest is more firm, shall we say, than a substantial legal basis of the previous conservative administrations, and was even pleased that I put in the idea of discretionary disclosure on the face of that memorandum, and it went through that way. Uh, but there was very little change, shall we say, to what I had uh, conceived and worked up with the exception of, and I'll state this publicly now, one paragraph of it that sort of sticks out like a sore thumb. It looks like maybe someone at the White House decided to throw in a paragraph about executive privilege, and I would certainly not be in a position to deny that, that what, that's what happened. <laughs> Reality being what it is. Uh, but then the difference was uh, we didn't uh, we didn't administer, we didn't enforce, we didn't implement that memorandum nearly uh, as much as we did the Reno Memorandum. It was a fractional thing to be sure. Yes, it was distributed, it was sent out, we included it in our training, but frankly we didn't sell it, to put it in very crass terms. Reno, we had uh, foreseeable harm, and everyone had to stop and think at least a little bit, uh, sometimes more than a little bit, do we really see any harm down the road uh, from this before we invoke the exemption, something technically falls within it, but maybe we can release it as a matter of administrative discretion. That's something we promoted very much under Reno. We did not promote that under Ashcroft. So or what really mattered when you cut to the core of the implementation of an attorney general memorandum is whether an agency changes from how it's used to doing business. There was a certain, I don't want to say inertia because that's a little bit too strong, but a certain entropy that applies and agencies had spent so many years routinely considering things for discretionary disclosure under the Clinton-Reno standards that unless they suddenly made a change because they thought they had to 
under Ashcroft and Bush 43, they would carry on to some degree and sometimes complete degree what they'd been doing previously. And that's what made a difference. Agencies did carry on in many instances to some degree, and it varies to be sure, with what they had been doing previously because we didn't, shall I put it this way, turn the battleship around. Uh, that was an expression that was used by Webb Hubble, who was the first Associate Attorney General for whom I worked under Clinton. He kept saying in his Southern drawl, we need to turn this battleship around. And that's what we did in 93 from how it had been for 12 years under Reagan, Reagan, and Bush 41. Well, we never turned the battleship under Ashcroft and Bush 43. We veered it a bit, but it never even got close to the 90 degree bar, let alone the full 180 around. And that's what you see reflected in the GAO report. Now, make no mistake, to be sure, what I'm describing is, to a certain degree, a glass half empty or half full situation. There were lots and lots of things that were withheld under the FOIA and as part of a secrecy pattern more broadly in the Bush 43 administration. It is unquestionably, or it was, I should now say, and it's nice to be able to use the past tense, it was unquestionably the most secretive administration in modern recorded history. And now that secrecy in a broader sense, including the FOIA, should be turned around greatly. As a matter of fact, if, if the whole idea during Clinton was to take the eight, 12 years of Reagan, Reagan, and Bush and turn the battleship around 180, well, I don't know what the correct continuation of that metaphor is when you're not just reacting to Reagan, Reagan, and Bush 41, but you're reacting to eight years of Bush 43. I think it's take the battleship, turn it around, and uh, make it jump up and down on the water three or four times <laughs> so it doesn't sink, because there's that much of a differential that has to be accomplished. Why? Because there was so much secrecy in the broader sense uh, to be changed. I will argue, and I constantly maintain, that there's not as much secrecy under the FOIA as people think, or it wasn't, there was a lot, but in the broader sense, tremendous amount of secrecy that should be turned around, especially on important public issues like civil liberties, uh, the terrorist screening program, de treatment of detainees, torture, terrorism matters, and the like. One more thing I should mention, lest it be forgotten. There are many who have said, understandably so perhaps, that the Ashcroft Memorandum, like so much of the remainder of the Bush administration's secrecy policies, was a reaction to 9-11. And the truth of the matter is, it's just not so. Because when I talk to media groups, and I've done this since 2001 when I was in, in government for many years, uh, post-Ashcroft, I would say, you have a disadvantage there, because I have a big advantage. I'm the guy who wrote the darn thing. I'm the guy who knows that only one word was changed after 9-11. I'm the guy who knows that I had it all lined up long before 9-11, and all that happened is that the White House had already put that paragraph in, and I changed just one word, and it was basically an innocuous word. And that's all that happened after September 11th. I think there has to be some concise articulation of the standard uh, so that assistant U.S. attorneys and Justice Department litigators in Maine Justice know how to gauge or judge or evaluate a newly filed case as to whether they'll defend it. Uh, if it were me, I would go to uh, the very concept that we had under Janet Reno, foreseeable harm. Uh, there are only a uh, few words that can be used to embellish that, but one that occurs to me is the phrase of uh, readily foreseeable harm, with the idea being that, okay, we made a change under Reno, uh, instead of just reflexively withholding just because it was exempt, now consider whether you can foresee. Well, I would say we'd go a little bit further this time, and I still say we as if I'm still there, which I should not, <laughs> go a little bit further this time and say readily foreseeable harm. In other words, don't spend all afternoon trying to envision it. Uh, if it doesn't strike you right off the bat, readily, you don't see any foreseeable harm, disclose it. 